Hello class, welcome to the online session. We are going to discuss on the fourth part of Neoplasia chapter. Okay, let's talk about the uh, reasons why <coughs> inflammation can uh, be one of the causes of cancer. Okay, so cancers can evoke an inflammatory reaction and would lead to a marked stromal response in such a way that they can be associated with non-healing wounds. So inflammatory cells can promote cancer through the following mechanisms. Number one, it can promote proliferation by releasing factors such as epidermal growth factor, EGF, and proteases that would promote the invasion. Number two is uh, it would uh, promote the removal of growth factors like ecadherin or other adhesion molecules, which would limit growth and would promote invasion. Another is it can enhance resistance to cell death. Uh, it can prevent anoikis, which is a form of cell death that is due to epithelial cell de de detachment. So this is through the attachment of tumor cells to tumor-associated macrophages that would possess integrin. And in that way, it would promote stromal invasion. Next is it will release VGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, which would induce angiogenesis or new blood vessel formation. It will activate uh, invasion by releasing proteases and it uh, promotes uh, tumor cell motility by releasing EGF and tumor necrosis factor, uh, as well as uh, uh, TGF beta would be uh, released that would promote epithelial to mesenchymal transition. And lastly, uh, inflammatory cells would release TGF beta, which would be geared towards immunosuppression through recruitment of immunosuppressive T regulatory cells, as well as suppress the function of CD8 cytotoxic T cells. Now let's talk about the different chromosomal abnormalities that would occur in cancer. The formation of tumors involving the activation of oncogene or the inactivation of the tumor suppressor gene would be associated with chromosomal abnormalities. Among them, translocation would be the most common mechanism. So it would lead to the presence of an overexpression of a proto-oncogene, which uh, we would see with substitution or the formation of a novel chimeric protein with oncogenic properties, which would be called as the fusion. And this would increase tyrosine kinase activity. Uh, and as we can see here, these are the examples of oncogenes that would be uh, created by translocation. Uh, we have here the CML, to which we would see the formation of the Philadelphia chromosome uh, with the formation of the BCR ABL gene. And then we also have another fusion gene in acute promyelocytic leukemia, which is the PML RARA. Uh, in Ewing sarcoma and in prostatic adenocarcinoma, we would see the formation of fusion genes. On the other hand, we would also see tumors that would show overexpression of oncogenes, like in Burkitt's lymphoma, with uh, translocation at chromosome 8Q24, the MCQ, uh, MYC would be in close proximity with the IGF, IGH locus, leading to control regions being coming from the IGH. And MYC would be overexpressed in this form of tumors, okay, leading to cellular proliferation of lymphocytes, or of atypical lymphocytes, or neoplastic lymphocytes. The same way with the other forms of lymphoma, like mantle cell lymphoma, wherein there would be CCND1 overexpression, and in follicular lymphoma, there would be BCL2 overexpression. We go back to the previous slide, and uh, here we also have the lesions, okay, which can be seen or which can occur in a tumor suppressor gene and a few cases of oncogene. RB or RB gene, uh, which is uh, which shows a deletion at uh, chromosome 13Q14 
or 1,4, uh, would be associated with the retinoblastoma. And VHL gene would be, uh, would be associated with chromosome 3P deletion, which we would see with renal cell carcinoma. Chromosome 1 deletion uh, would be seen in, uh, in a subset of ALL, okay? And uh, this would show overexpression of TAL1 oncogene. And in a few subsets of, uh, of lung tumors, approximately 25%, they, uh, they would uh, present with uh, CHR5 deletion, which would uh, show a fusion gene called EML4ALK. Uh, gene amplification or gene uh, amplification would be uh, associated with oncogene activation. And we would see examples like NMYC in neuroblastoma and ERB, ERRB2, which is seen in breast cancer. In NMYC, this can be in the form of extra chromosomal double minutes formation or the formation of the HSR, which is the homogeneous staining region. And this is associated with 25 to 30% of cases of neuroblastoma. ERRB2, on the other hand, or what you call as the HER2, is associated with its activation in 20% of breast cancers and would confer a poor prognosis. Chromotrypsis is uh, referred to as the breaking of the chromosome, shattering of the chromosome, or haphazard repair of genes. is seen in 1% to 2% of cancers, more so in 25% of osteosarcomas and in glioblastoma. So uh, this is an example of a, trans, uh, of a uh, translocation okay, that is used as a target for targeted therapy. And this form of targeted therapy is called differentiation therapy. Uh, in the upper portion of the illustration, it shows to us the normal condition wherein uh, a neutrophil or other myeloid precursors would be further differentiated. As you can see here, there would this would be the there would be the presence of the RXR and the uh, RER or the retinoic uh, acid receptor alpha, which uh, in the presence of the retinoic acid would uh, lead to the differentiation of myeloid cells. Okay. Uh, in the presence of uh, a translocation uh, with the formation of the PML. Uh, RERA fusion gene, uh, there would be the uh, redu a reduction in the affinity of retinoic acid okay, to the uh, RERA binding site. And this would lead to inhibition or to the blockage of differentiation of the myeloid precursors into neutrophils, eosinophils, or basophils. And it will lead to the proliferation of myeloid precursors like myeloblast, myelocytes, and promyelocytes. So with differentiation therapy, uh, they would use the ATRA or the all trans retinoic acid, which in pharmacologic state or pharmacologic doses, it uh, would allow binding of the retinoic acid to the fusion gene and would displace the, uh, the repressor complex leading to the activation of gene transcription and allow differentiation into the uh, into neutrophils into eosinophils and basophils okay so allowing the uh, allowing those cells precursor cells into maturation so with regards to epigenetic alterations in cancer when we talk about epigenetics this would refer to changes in gene expression. Take note that it is reversible and occurs in the absence of mutation. So this is done through post-translation histone modification 
leading to the DNA compaction as well as methylation which occurs at the CPG nucleotides to regulate or turn off gene expression. Okay, so a very important thing to remember here in epigenetics is that these are reversible processes because they are made by enzymes, okay? So in this particular illustration, we would see the presence of uh, methylation, okay? Uh, it can be hyper or hypo. When we have hypermethylation, it can inactivate tumor suppressor genes or DNA repair genes. If we go into hypomethylation, it would lead to chromosomal instability, oncogene activation, or the uh, formation of a retrotransposone, which can, these are genetic elements that can induce mutation. With regards to histone modification, uh, this is associated with gene repression and uh, most probably with tumor suppressor genes, okay? So epigenetic modifications can generate a tumor differentiation with a production of a gene expression for a particular cell type. So there's a specific differentiation. What are the modifiers here? So this would involve enzymes. That's why it is reversible. Enzymes like methylases and histone deacetylases, and these are now targets for tumor therapy. Okay. However, okay, however, tumors would also have heterogeneity. And one of the examples for heterogeneity of tumors would be drug resistance. So not all tumors can respond to, uh, to therapy with regards to epigenetic modifications. Okay, so these are the, some of the regulatory genes that are muta mutated in cancer. So we have the genes, okay, we have their function and the tumors that can be identified when you have genetic mutations, okay, like the DNMT3A associated with 20% of acute myeloid leukemia. MLL1, which is associated with acute leukemia in infants, 90%. MLL2, which is associated with follicular lymphoma, 90%. SNF5, which is associated with rhabdoid tumor, 100%. Okay, so take note that these are mutated genes. And the mutation of these genes can lead to alterations in the enzyme process. However, again, because uh, epigenetics okay, would be associated with alteration in the enzyme processes. This can be reversible. Okay. So next we go to non-coding RNA and its association with cancer. So microRNA or mRNA are involved in normal cell growth survival and differentiation. So they are they would inhibit messenger RNA translation. Uh, microRNAs or non-coding uh, RNAs have been shown to undergo changes in cancer cells with frequent amplification and deletion within the RNA loci. Okay, so it can be a down regulatory function, which we would see with. Uh, the inactivation of the tumor suppressor gene or an upregulatory function, which is more of oncogene uh, activation. Okay, so um, overactivity of oncogenic microRNA, like the MIR2200 or the MIR155, would lead to the down regulation of the tumor suppressor genes. Okay, on the other hand, if we have Loss of function or underactivity of uh, MIR15 or MIR16, okay, which is geared towards tumor suppression, there would be oncogene upregulation or activation. Example of uh, this microRNAs uh, would be the down regulation of microRNA leading to overexpression of uh, BCL2. Uh, in leukemia 
and in lymphoma. Now let's go with the molecular basis of multi-step carcinogenesis. So always remember that when we have tumors, uh, it would require an accumulation of mutations for it uh, to, be to, to be able to give rise to uh, tumorogenesis. Okay, so in this particular model, this would occur in the formation of an adenoma and then it would lead to carcinoma. So this is what we call as the adenoma carcinoma sequence. So uh, in this particular model, it starts with the accumulation of a germline mutation or a somatic mutation, uh, which would serve as the first hit uh, with the inactivation uh, with the with, uh, mutation towards APC. So remember in tumor suppressor genes, uh, we need two alleles uh, to be mutated for inactivation of the tumor suppressor gene. Okay, And then this would be followed by the second hit. So uh, this would be an inactivation uh, by mutation and hypermethylation. Okay, Remember, hypermethylation, you would have inactivation of the tumor suppressor. And then this would be followed by activation of an oncogene, which is the KRAS or KRAS. And then uh, once you have the RAS uh, oncogene uh, mutation, it can lead to adenomas. If the P53 is uh, normal, which we would term as the wild type P53, DNA damage would be identified uh, because of the mutations and it can lead to senescence, okay, senescence. However, if the P53 would be inactivated, okay, which can follow uh, KRAS mutation, then it will lead to uh, other inactivation okay, uh, with, uh, uh, with PPT, PP2, uh, PP2 mutation as well as telomerase activation leading to carcinoma. Okay, next we go to uh, chemical carcinogenesis. So chemical carcinogenesis would require two steps. We have the initiation and promotion. With regards to initiation, this would uh, refer to the exposure of cells to sufficient dose of a carcinogenic agent or initiator. And this uh, carcinogenic agent would be electrophilic. It binds to the nuclear sites, which are electron rich. And the initiation here would lead to a non lethal DNA damage okay, with mutation. Okay. And uh, once it is uh, bound to the DNA, it would require one cycle of proliferation to cause a permanent. DNA lesion. And that's the time that we call it as the initiated cell. So uh, after this one, uh, for tumorogenesis to occur with chemical exposure, there should be the next step, which is promotion. In promotion, the initiated cell would be exposed to that agent and the promoter would induce cellular proliferation. But it, as, uh, as uh, an individual or if it is uh, exposed to the uh, cell okay, alone, it is non-tumorigenic. It will not cause mutation, but simply it will cause the, uh, it will cause stimulate, uh, it will stimulate the vision and proliferation of mutated cells. Okay? So once we have initiation, followed by mutation, then that's the time that we can cause malignant neoplasm. Okay, so in, ex in an experiment that was uh, performed, we see here five groups that would be exposed to the initiators or promoters or both. Okay, so as you can see, there are in, uh, there are, there's the formation of uh, tumors in two groups and there would be absence of tumor formation in three groups. Uh, in groups two and three, the, uh, 
the sequence for the application of initiation, okay, which is uh, the X, followed by the promotion would lead to tumors. So even if there's uh, uh, a difference in time, okay, it will always lead to the formation of tumors as long as the sequence between the application of initiation first followed by promotion would be followed. As you can see in group one, only one of the step would be applied and that would be initiation. Okay, and no follow up with promotion application. So no two more would be formed. In the same way, if we have uh, the application of the promotion alone, okay, it will not form the tumor. And if you are going to inverse the application from promotion first and then followed by initiation, it will not lead to tumor formation. Only when you would add another agent here that is a promoter would uh, uh, that would come as a, a reason for the formation of a tumor. So now let's talk about the different forms of chemical carcinogens. So we have the direct acting carcinogen in the form of alkylating agents and acylating agents. And these are known to cause cancer, but these are weak carcinogens. When you, when you say direct acting carcinogens, it means that there is uh, no requirement for metabolic con conversion. So they are, uh, they are already carcinogenic. Okay? So no metabolic conversion would be required for the chemical to become carcinogenic. So among these direct acting carcinogens would be the anti-cancer drugs like cyclophosphamide, chloramducil, nitro so ureas and others okay so why is it, is it still being used for cancer uh, because uh, they are effective and uh, the formation of, of a secondary form of cancer is of low incidence okay however it is still there or present and then we have the indirect acting agents which would require metal, metabolic conversion to an ultimate carcinogen. It means that it requires P450 metabolism leading to carcinogenesis. So what are examples of this? We have the uh, polycyclic and heterocyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, okay, uh, which would be derived from fossil fuels and from cigarette smoking. We have the amines, amides, and azodyes, which can be seen in rubber industries. Okay? And then we have the natural plant and microbiological, micro, microbial products uh, in the form of aflatoxin, which is seen with aspergillus uh, fungal, fungal infections. Uh, and then we have the others, which would be used in uh, food preservatives like nitrosamines. We also have the insecticides and the polychlorinated biphenyls. Okay, so the, the, uh, this is part of chemical carcinogenesis, which is promotion. Uh, promoter or promotion can be exogenous or endogenous. Uh, take note that uh, they are non-mutagenic non-tumorigenic and they would stimulate cellular proliferation for clonal expansion as, uh, as long as uh, that particular cell is an initiated cell already okay so what are, what are examples of this uh, the, uh, this type of uh, of agents we have the hormones bile salts we have smoking and alcohol we have drugs, viral agents, and phenols. Okay, so now we talk about the uh, carcinogenesis associated with uh, ultraviolet light uh, exposure. So these are the uh, 
uh, three types of cancers that can be associated with ultraviolet light exposure. So we, we have here the squamous cell carcinoma. This would be the basal cell carcinoma and then the melanoma. The UV light or, or the radiant energy would be in the form of ultraviolet light. And the solar spectrum would be divided into three wavelengths. We have the UV, UVA, which would uh, range from 320 to 400 nanometers. We have the UVB, which would range from 280 to 320 UV, uh, nanometers. And then you have the UVC, which would range from 200 to 280 nanometers. Okay? So among the three uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, wavelengths okay, uh, or types, the UVB is believed to be the one responsible for induction of skin cancers. The UVC is a potential mutagen. However, it doesn't reach uh, our area, the land area, because it is already filtered by the ozone. So the principles of UV carcinogenesis would be the following. So upon exposure of our skin to UV light, there would be the formation of pyrimidine dimers in the DNA. Okay? And this would, repair, would be repaired by the nucleotide excision repair, so in normal condition. However, in patients with seroderma pigmentosum, okay, which would have a defect in the nucleotide excision repair, this will not be repaired and would lead to skin cancer. In ionizing radiation, take note that all, all forms of uh, IR or ionizing radiation would be carcinogenic. And the most common uh, types of cancer associated with ionizing radiation would be leukemia and thyroid cancer as evidenced by uh, the different forms of cancer found during nuclear holocaust as well as in uh, the exposure uh, during the uh, Chernobyl incident. Okay. Aside from leukemia and thyroid cancer, it can also cause lung cancer, breast cancer, and salivary gland uh, neoplasm. So uh, this is the end of my lecture. Uh, I hope that you have learned something uh, during this time. Thank you and good, uh, good day.